Which brings us to part two, defining the investment problem. My childhood state of Maine has a rich maritime history, so I'm inclined to use boating analogies. Imagine then that we wish to sail across the ocean. Before we can decide on the type of boat that we're going to need, we first must come to understand the winds and currents, the likely severity of storms that we might experience, how different boat designs might be expected to behave under different circumstances, and how long the trip could take. Only once we have a clear picture can we then construct an appropriate vessel to take us on our journey. Let us assume that at present all we know is that we need a boat that will get us to our destination as quickly as possible, but that it also will minimize the possibility that it will capsize and cause us to drown. Usually these two goals compete with one another. The safest boats tend to be large but slow ocean liners, while the fastest boats are small and light but less safe. So we have a challenge. A successful investment strategy must somehow address both the safety and performance concerns rather than compromise either. In my next section, let me outline for you eight aspects of the investment environment that Dow Wealth Management considers to be essential to understand in order to design an appropriate portfolio and a strategy that seems capable of getting us to our destination safely and at a good pace. These are, one, the natural behavior of financial markets. Two, the problem of perceived market trends. Three, the high risk of even seemingly unlikely events. Four, the efficient market hypothesis and the limitations it imposes on investors. Five, a distinction between risk and volatility. Six, the relationship between risk and reward. Seven, two types of irrecoverable portfolio loss that investors must guard against. And eight, the importance of the efficiency of an investment strategy. So let's first start by getting an understanding of how financial markets behave. The real estate and stock markets have, of course, been through a recent boom and bust cycle. So that you don't feel alone, let me show you a few other markets. This is the behavior of the U.S. stock market back in the 1920s and 1930s. And as you can see, there was an enormous rise in, in valuations, up 467%, followed by a precipitous decline. Here's how low-quality stocks performed in the 1990s and early 2000. This is the low-quality index of the NASDAQ, with an enormous rise followed by a precipitous decline. You've probably heard that gold only goes up. That's why I keep hearing on television. Here's a graph of gold prices in the early 1970s and 1980s. And as you can see, after its decline, it took 28 years before price levels reached their former high. Let's look at another geographic region of the world, the Far East and the experience of Japan in the late 1980s and onward. Here is the Nikkei 225. There's been no recovery even decades later. What we can see then is that large market gains followed by steep declines are not all that unusual. In fact, such behavior should be expected. This behavior can be said to be true for all markets, for all time periods, and for all geographic regions of the world. So the market declines recently experienced here and elsewhere are not unique and they're not a new phenomenon of our modern times. Rather, they have been ever present since trading markets first evolved. If it's not already apparent, let me show you in just one other format how we understand the ever-present dangers of any financial market. All is progressing well, and then... A suddenly exploding volcano is the best metaphor that I've been able to imagine for how many investors probably felt as they watched their portfolios come apart during the recent financial crisis. These destructive volcanic eruptions will happen from time to time. This is simply the unfortunate nature of the environment in which we as investors must work. So as we think about how to construct a portfolio, we need to be aware that regardless of the market in which we invest, eventually it's sure to suffer a devastating crisis. Let me discuss another aspect of these abrupt changes in the financial markets. Sometimes trends can last for exceedingly long periods of time before there's a sharp reversal. It is during such periods that many investors become complacent. They forget how quickly the financial weather can change and how harsh the storms can be. In a sense, then, 
financial markets almost set traps for investors. As memories of bad times fade, many investors will subject their portfolios to increasing amounts of risk. Consequently, when the reversal finally comes, their portfolios are badly positioned to survive, and therefore they lose far more wealth than what they may ever recover. We might put it this way. If the volcano has been quiet for decades, then someone without the perspective of time might be tempted to build his house on its slopes in order to get a good view. But perhaps he'll get a view he never intended. What we have discussed so far is that the market storms can be severe, but that the upward trends sometimes last so long that we all might be dead before the next calamity. If that is the case, then should we even care about the risk of an economic or market crisis, especially if one doesn't seem imminent? If the skies look clear, maybe we should just set sail and hope for the best. Suppose, for example, we conclude that a severe recession tends to occur just once every 40 years. We might be tempted to believe that this risk is remote and so disregard it. However, if we do the calculation, an event that is expected to happen only once every 40 years means that there is a 25% chance that it'll happen during the next 10 years. Who among us would risk a one in four chance of being financially wiped out in the next 10 years? Because we are usually working with irreplaceable assets and because our clients are usually invested with a multi-generational time horizon, at Dow Wealth Management, we take the view that even a seemingly remote risk of an irrecoverable loss is too big for us not to try to guard against it. Long-term investors are sure to confront a storm eventually and must be prepared so as not to get wiped out. Understanding how financial markets behave is an important consideration if we're going to invest in them. If economic crises happen from time to time, why don't we just get out of the market before it crashes? If we see a storm coming, just pull into a safe harbor and wait it out. Certainly that would seem like the prudent approach and would solve all of our foregoing concerns. Let me introduce you to a few guys you might have met before. This fellow says, the market's going up. His colleague says, real estate never goes down. You can't go wrong with copper. The market's about to crash. Get out quick. And last fellow, the market's going to return 30% next year. These are the guys who make their living telling others what they think the markets will do next, which sectors will do well and which won't. Unfortunately, nobody has such a talent. Here is a simple concept with an elaborate name. The Efficient Market Hypothesis The Efficient Market Hypothesis states that, at any given time, security prices fully reflect all available information. This hypothesis is broadly accepted in academic circles and has been demonstrated to be valid in countless studies. This simple statement has profound implications. Without access to inside information, the current price of a security can only be assumed to be its correct price. It's impossible to know if a stock is underpriced or that a stock is overpriced. Therefore, we cannot predict if a stock price is going to rise or fall in the short term. We cannot predict short-term movements in the overall stock market. We cannot predict changes in interest rates, the inflation rate, or currency exchange rates. We cannot outperform the market sector in which we invest. Depressing, isn't it? We cannot do those very things which, if we could do them, could enable us to create enormous wealth. You may be sure, then, that it is only begrudgingly that we subscribe to the efficient market hypothesis. So this is bad news for us in designing our investment strategy, because we cannot rely on our financial advisor, our neighbor, or the guy we read about in the newspaper to tell us when to get out of the water. Their accuracy is no better than that of random chance. However, we're not helpless passengers on a boat. We can at least select the vessel. There's not just one securities market, but many markets in many market sectors in which we can participate. Selecting an appropriate market and sector are critical decisions. Acceptance of the efficient market hypothesis should not be discouraging. Rather, a big part of being successful in investing is appreciating what cannot be done so that we don't expend time, money, and mental energy in its pursuit or rely wrongly on our approach only to be disappointed. But are the markets really efficient? My colleagues and I are not oblivious to the substantial and recurring debate among investors about whether the financial markets are efficient. In fact, superficially, there would seem to be much evidence that they're not. 
Let me comment on that for a moment. Let us suppose that it is possible to predict the future and that there is some investment professional, some academic, or some investment firm's computer program that can accurately predict future market moves. How then do we go about figuring out who this person or firm is? Or let me ask it another way. If there were such a talent out there, why did so many financial companies across the globe, with billions of dollars at their disposal to find such a person, go belly up? If these companies could not identify such a person, then why should we expect to have any better luck? If you watch the media carefully, the people who are considered to be market gurus change every few years. They have a bad habit of being badly wrong eventually. So please forgive me. I've grown wary of people in my profession who claim to know far more than they really do. Successful investing must begin with a good sense of humility. I don't do my clients or myself any good by relying on claimed talents that just don't exist. Now consider our view of the world. First, we know that devastating market reversals happen from time to time. Second, we cannot even rely on the ability of our advisor to tell us when to get out of the water before a storm. That is a troubling and dire prospect. So what does that tell us about designing and building our boat? It tells us that we had better make it rugged enough to withstand even the rarest of severe storms, because sure enough, if we're investing for decades to come, in time, we're going to run across some very bad weather. And if our portfolio capsizes, the family fortune likely will be forever lost because they're rarely ever rebuilt. There are two additional concepts that we think are important to understand when working within the financial markets. These are the concepts of risk versus volatility and risk and reward. Economists have their own definition for risk, but for our purposes, my company defines it simply as follows. Risk is the potential for incurring a permanent loss. Suppose that I invest a million dollars into a speculative hedge fund. Shortly thereafter, the fund goes bankrupt and I get wiped out. I'll probably conclude that I had incurred considerable risk. Volatility, on the other hand, is a cause for temporary loss. Suppose that I invest a million dollars into a portfolio of blue chip stocks, which then declines in value to 700,000, but a few years later, it's worth 2 million. I'll probably conclude that the initial decline was simple volatility and that my risk of an irrecoverable loss was small. When investing, in Dow Wealth Management's view, we hope to minimize risk while being willing to endure volatility. Such investors seem apt to reap considerable rewards while not losing sleep that they might lose everything. Enduring market volatility is not desirable or pleasant. However, in theory, capitalism must pay greater returns to such investors, or no one would ever expose this capital to such fluctuations in value. Another boating analogy might help to clarify the difference between how we perceive risk and volatility. In our desire to cross the Atlantic Ocean, suppose that we have the choice between two vessels. We can take a speedboat or we can travel by ocean liner. If the seas are calm, the speedboat will get us to the shores of the UK in a few days. But if there is a storm, we'll all drown. On the other hand, if we take an ocean liner, our travel will be slower, but the storm will only cause us motion sickness. We're relatively assured that we'll reach our destination. Those who travel by speedboat expose themselves to risk. Those who travel by ocean liner expose themselves to volatility. Most investors can usually find temporary volatility to be acceptable. The risk of permanent loss is obviously not. You probably have all heard that risk equals reward. In other words, if we want a higher return on our investments, then we must take greater risk. This has become the expectation of many investors. The implication is that if we risk our money, we deserve higher compensation and will eventually get it. At Dow, we consider that view to be nonsense. If that were the case, then no one would ever put his money in anything but risky investments since they would, in fact, not be risky. There seems to be a sentiment that risk can be adequately addressed by broad diversification. In other words, we might own a large number of risky investments. In this manner, even if a number of them suffer irreversible losses, the others might be prospering giving us an overall positive experience. This is Dow Wealth Management's view on risk and reward. High risk generates high returns for some investors sometimes. Or to put it another way, 
Sometimes all high-risk investments collapse at the same time, so that diversification among them does not do any good. So let us remember high risk does not guarantee high returns. When we think about wealth preservation, we need to be aware that there are two ways that we can suffer irrecoverable losses. The first is the loss of our principal. As previously stated, if we invest a million dollars in a fund and it goes bankrupt, there is no hope of recovery. The second is the loss of our principal's purchasing power due to inflation. Suppose that an investor places a million dollars in a safe deposit box. Our investor might believe that he can sleep well at night. He's assured that his money is secure and available to him whenever he wants it. We say, however, that although the investor's principal is safe, he has merely taken on a new kind of risk. In fact, he probably shouldn't sleep well at all. The great risk borne by the investor is the safety of his purchasing power. Today's dollar, euro, pound, or other currency surely will not be as valuable 10 years from now. Because of inflation, they won't be as valuable even one year from now. Using constant dollars at a 3% inflation rate, the purchasing power of a million dollars erodes to $740,000 in 10 years, a 26% loss of purchasing power. At a 10% inflation rate in just a decade, a million dollars would be worth just $350,000 in today's currency. What have we accomplished then if we succeed in protecting our principal, but after a few years, it buys much less than it does today? Moderate inflation is always a problem that we have to guard against. From time to time, countries experience what is known as hyperinflation, when the inflation rate exceeds 50% annually. That kind of event can wipe out a fortune literally overnight if one is not protected against it. So I want to dispel the notion that paper money is safe. Here is a list of countries that have experienced hyperinflation. Historically, globally, even this worst of the worst is not exactly uncommon. During the recent financial crisis, many investors fled to cash thinking it would afford them good protection against loss. In many instances, they could be in for a surprise. Ultimately, cash is only ink on paper or an entry on a computer screen. Governments routinely devalue their currencies, and sometimes they devalue them quickly. Some examples. A 1 million mark note from Germany, 1924. A 10 million pengo note from Hungary, 1945. A 100 dinar note from Bosnia in 1992. Devalued to one-tenth of one percent when the government stamped three more zeros on them. Yugoslavia issued a 500 billion dinar note in 1993. Not to be outdone, Zimbabwe issued a 50 trillion dollar bill in 2008, followed by a 100 trillion dollar note that I purchased off eBay for a few US dollars. If our president would print just a single such bill, he could pay off the $15 trillion U.S. debt six times over. The loss of our investment's purchasing power can be every bit as devastating to our portfolio as would be the permanent loss of principal. In structuring an investment portfolio, Dow Wealth Management's view is that if we're to be successful in preserving our wealth, we must have an investment approach that guards our portfolio against a permanent loss of principal and an erosion of its purchasing power and the strategy must accomplish both of these goals simultaneously. Why simultaneously? Why don't we wait to adopt an investment strategy that guards against inflation until just before it becomes a problem? Because we must assume that quickly accelerating inflation cannot be predicted either. Therefore, if we wait to take action, the damage may already be done before we realize just how bad the problem is. Now let me discuss the last of the eight elements. Over the years, we have observed that many investment products badly underperform the markets in which they invest. For example, during a period when the stock market rises 25%, perhaps a mutual fund underperforms it and earns just 20%. Or if the market falls 15%, the mutual fund declines even further, tumbling 20%. In other words, the fund earns less during the good years and it loses more during the down years. During prosperous times, many investors don't even notice the underperformance because they're earning high returns even despite the costs. Investors tend to be dismissive of high costs when they're making money. Unfortunately, as investors continue to suffer the high costs of an investment program, 
during a stagnant or declining market, their overall investment experience can prove to be dismal. In this table, we assume a million dollars is invested in a mutual fund that has embedded costs of 5% annually. Therefore, with the stock market going up 25% annually after five years, giving a $2 million return, the mutual fund investor making 20% annually ends up with a $1.5 million return. But now assume, as happens, the bull market ends and the market stagnates for the next five years. The stock market generating 0% for the next five years still leaves us with $2 million, while the mutual fund investor losing 5% annually now seizes $1.5 million declined to $900,000. And so, referring back to the efficiency of portfolio design, an essential criterion of a successful portfolio experience is to be aware of and avoid investment products and strategies that have high costs. And we need to be aware of these costs even during periods when profits come quickly and expenses merely appear not to matter. We simply can't justify giving away a large portion of our investment returns during a bull market stage because we therefore would not have earned enough to sustain the portfolio during periods of famine. Or to use another boating analogy, we don't want to build the perfect boat only to be slowed down by dragging the anchor. This then is the animal that Dow Wealth Management believes we must tame in order to improve our prospects for being successful investors over the long term. We must be able to design a portfolio that addresses these critical problems and that functions well within the dynamics that will confront, while recognizing our own inherent limitations. There is no magic. So far, then, I have not painted a very encouraging picture for us. However, it is only by first understanding the dynamics of investing and the nature of the financial markets that we then have a possibility of finding a way to work effectively within them.